as he said, we'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 2, the first 10 verses. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who in his rich mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us, in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. Not by work so that anyone can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us. Thank you. Amen. I want to thank everybody for coming and the guest and uh, friends, family, uh, acquaintances, and I'm really honored to, that you all showed up here. Not that I wanted to be an honor, but uh, this is this is. Now. Oh, please be seated. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Jack. You, know, you know, in the old days, they stood the whole time, so. But I got it, and thank you. I'm sorry about that. I thought everything looks good here. I'm thinking, but, uh, I do appreciate everybody coming. It's really awesome. Uh, Bill. I could just name a lot of different people, so. Can you hear me okay? No. No. Uh, I heard. I'll talk real loud then. Is that better? Okay. I had this mic because sometimes I, I do tend to lower my voice a little bit. But And that, that, the song, the first song we had was kind of a, a showing we are all from ashes to beauty. The second one, by his spirit we're empowered like the days of Elijah. And at the last song that we will sing, I may let you guess about that one, but it's about the journey. It, it, there's a chronological order. Uh, I didn't take credit for that. That's just the way. Sometimes God's spirit works that way. Uh, I, I want to just mention a few things about the Brethren Church because the more I found out about the Brethren Church, the more I was kind of surprised that they were one of the most persecuted groups uh, at the time of all Christians. In fact, I won't, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to say they were the first advocates to fight against uh, the, the abuse of Indians. And they repatriated. They tried to pay them back for the land that they took. They were uh, the first abolitionist. Uh, they were the first ones that published, uh, that fought against slavery years and years uh, before, well, in, in the late 1700s. And they've got an amazing history that at one time, the Brethren Church, when they migrated because of the persecution, if you were a Brethren in Europe or a lot of, they called them the Dunkers or the Anabaptists, the redunking or rebaptizing. And so, here were the three choices they had if they stayed. Uh, it, they could stay behind and be put on a ship. Oh, let, me, let me get this right. They'd be sent to the galleys. The Lutherans would send those who resisted uh, the teaching of what they taught, like infant baptism, things like that. They would be sent to the galleys. The others, the Reformed Church, would put them in prison them for, with hard labor for life. And the, the Catholics, we got, we got a, lot, a little easier off. They killed you, so the, the pain was over. So 
these were the, the ones that were persecuted because they didn't believe in infant baptism. So they stayed their ground, they migrated here, and there's less persecution here. So it's kind of an interesting history of the Brethren Church that there are a lot to, that I did not know. But I'm going to turn to Matthew 25, and I'm going to camp out right there. Uh, Matthew 25, uh, verse 31 through 40, and I'm not sure we'll get through it all, but I want to start uh, at Matthew 25, verse 31. When we describe the body of Christ, it's the church, we have hands and feet and eyes, and you know, we are part of the body. So Jesus can't be here. Guess who gets to be Jesus here on earth? It's us. Now, I know Jesus sees the hungry, the thirsty, the strangers, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, and He tells us to go. I didn't know what we were going to do when I came here several years ago. I was thumbing through the Bible, and I go, I had, this was a huge oversight on my part. So for many years, I told you I was a pew potato. Pretty much sit and soak. And, and I wouldn't move beyond the four walls. But we must be His hands, His feet, His eyes, His ears, His voice, and His arms. And I'll show you, I have biblical evidence to prove that. So Jesus sees those. The question is, we asked ourselves, do we? In Matthew 25, verse 31, speaking of the day of judgment, I'm reading out of the NASB because the NASB is one of the best translations, uh, translating the Greek in the New Testament and the Hebrew in the Old. Uh, and it also puts in italics uh, what it was input, implanted by the transcribers. Uh, they, when they transcribed it, they thought, well, this will make this flow a little better. I want to know what words they put in there. So that's kind of why I like the NASB and my old King James Bible does the same thing. Matthew 25, verse 31. Would you pray with me? Father, have your way with us, Holy Spirit. Send the Spirit here to speak and for the hearing to be able to effectually change our hearts. Give us the heart of Christ for those things that break your heart should break our heart. Let us get out of our comfort zone and do those things that we are commanded to do, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. And so I commit this service into your hands for your glory of the great name, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Speaking of the Son, verse 31, Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in all His glory and the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put his sheep on the right, indicating the sign of authority, okay, authority from God. And the others on the left, which are as a sign of judgment, because if you're not for Christ, you are against Christ. So the left and the right indicating something very important. As it says in verse 34, the king will say to those, on his right. I'm assuming most of us are at the right hand of Jesus in that having that authority that he gave the church. And not to me alone, not to elders alone, not to, not to deacons alone, to all of us. Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Sounds like Ephesians 1. And so does Ephesians 2.10. That's why I had Cindy read that. We are His workmanship created for good works in Christ Jesus. So the body of Christ is working. Here's how it works. Verse 35, Matthew 25. And, and I love this. Because there are, notice, the first thing I noticed, there are six me's. So what we do here for Christ, it's for Him. It's not for us. If we do it for us, we're robbing God from glory, and God will not accept that work. Verse 35, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger, and you invited me in. It's not me, but He. Okay. The Light of Hope Women's Ministry does a yearly outreach to the poor at the beginning of the school year. Uh, they also do community service for juvenile offenders and adult offenders both. Uh, that is, that to me, is the gospel. And that's what I think, I'll, I'll let you understand here. So doing for others really is doing it for Christ. 
Okay, we're not doing for someone else. And what we don't do for Christ, we don't do for, uh, for others, we don't do for Christ. Verse 35, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. As I mentioned, we also collect canned goods. Uh, there's another thing that we, our prison ministry, we send commissary money. Winfield lets me bring meals to prisoners. Uh, so we're, we're also feeding them the Word of God, which was satisfies forever. So it's not just, he's not thinking, well, the guy's hungry, let's give him lunch. There's a lot more to that than that, that you might think uh, at, at first. We feed them the Word of God. And some of the Bible tracts that go with that, and some of the preaching that uh, Brother Robert does on the street to the homeless, that's exactly what he's doing. He's, he's giving food, the manna from heaven, to the hungry. Verse 35, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. This is not real water necessarily. It might be real water, which we distributed a couple years ago uh, at Old Settler's Day. But it's talking about the living water. You know, we want to give a guy a class of uh, cold water and say, see you later. Or we, some of the social gospels, they will build wells, but they won't speak of the living water. You know, it's okay to give them a drink, but what happens after that? You know, the living water is the water that satisfies forever. And I think that's what he's thinking about. Not just a drink of water, I feel better, thank you. There's a lot more to it. Uh, for example... Uh, we do street evangelism, we do door-to-door, -door. we do Bible tracts, we go into prisons, we do community events, we go to Halloween event, we go out, out of the four walls of the church uh, because people that are thirsty may come here, but we can't be sure. If not, we're going to go out there and find that, that person. Next, and I love this, I was a stranger and you invited me in. This reminds me, uh, again, of the juvenile and adult offenders who have no idea who we are when they come here, but they know when they leave. They have a really good idea. They hear the gospel. You know, we can, they can take care of that problem, uh, but the bigger problem is they're a sinner and are separated from God. That's the big problem. They're offending God, not just the local authorities. So I love that. John and Connie Hunter both transport Jack made. Little Jack's not here today. We, we made him. He was a stranger, and he was really shy when he got here, and he didn't easily make friends. It took us a long time to warm up to Jack, or him to us, I guess is really what it is. So... That's making a stranger feel welcome. Uh, Martha's got a, my wife's got a uh, prayer page that she gets prayer requests, uh, even from people who are not Christians. So it's in a way that connects the community and so many. And this has been going on for two years. Uh, a lot of people uh, ask for prayer at this. So and they're strangers, and we don't know. She may not know. It's a friend of my cousin or my. We don't know who they are, but we post. We pray for them. That's making strangers uh, feel welcome. Is making Jesus feel welcome. Uh, so they're not strangers anymore once they hit that prayer, their prayer page. We know them and we pray for them, and even if we don't know them, it doesn't matter. So we like to greet people like Jesus met Zacchaeus, except they're not up in a tree. When they come in, we want to embrace them and we greet them, and we've done better. I think we've improved. I've improved in that regard. And rather than not recognize somebody coming in, we don't overwhelm them, but we certainly greet them and we welcome them. They're strangers when they walk out, but they're not strangers anymore. And I would say this, they're not any stranger than I am. Bad joke. But <laughs> Next, in the next verse, I was naked and you clothed me. Okay? I think the first person I thought of it is Carla and Robert Maine, who are... Uh, delivering clothing and maybe and I got some clothes for you I forgot to tell you that I have clothing and, and Bible tracts and preaching the Word of God on the street to the homeless you know that's a lot of that is is making uh, satisfying their thirst and their hunger too so that that spreads out over a lot of areas in Matthew 25 so he preaches to the homeless the, uh, the, the light of hope the women also give to annual uh, low-income families every at the beginning of the school year so we're helping those in that way, it is almost literal. And your clothing is naked. You're literally clothing the naked. So we're taking this verse, seeing what the body of Christ should do, and then we're plugging it in with uh, faith with feet or shoe leather. And that's what it looks like. And I'm telling you, I'm not saying this because I'm right, because I didn't. I was neglecting this for many years. I would say I was living out the great O mission instead of the commission. And that's why I like the brethren, they are... They are evangelists, and they go to places. That's what they do, and they go to different areas uh, that hardly other people uh, may think about. Now, 
I was sick and you visited me. Imagine when you went out to visit the person in the hospital and, and, and it was, and I, I went up and saw Bill several times, I know, and he, well, I visited him, I actually visited Jesus. Sorry, Bill, I'm busy, I'm with Jesus. No, it's not that way. But that's the, the effect. When you visit somebody that is sick, you're visiting him. It's, if Bill gets the benefits of that, okay? But that's what we're supposed to do. James 1.27, in fact, says, pure and undefiled religion is visiting the orphans and the widows. Uh, they're sick. Uh, our elder John said one time, he goes, they are shut in. They're in prison too, in a body, in a nursing home. Uh, so, and Paul and I, uh, we, we kind of had that nursing home thing going. They've adopted us. They love us. The, the older people are just so tender-hearted. And a couple of them almost moved to tears. We were getting that close. So, uh, Paul, my faithful friend, has been there with me every single time. The only exception was when he had heart surgery. And I asked him, well, what's up, Paul? And I, I just let him off the hook on that. That's how devoted he is. He's helping him in hymnals and moving pianos on, while he's on a cane. And, and so that tells you, it speaks to the heart. Now, the point is I want to say about all this. We didn't say, okay, you do this, and you do that, and you do this. It's happened. It's the Spirit. I didn't do it. I didn't write marching orders. Why don't you do this, and this is a great idea. This happened uh, really by accident. I would say accident, but God had this plan all along because the nursing home ministry started by accident when Mildred, one of our former members, now in glory, went to the nursing home. And I went to the nursing home, and one thing started clicking after another. I go, you know what, maybe these people, maybe they want somebody to visit with them. And that's kind of how that launched. So I'm not saying, well, I need to do this. It just God does that. God does this. So, and how many are orphans and widows in the nursing home? Almost all. So that's pure religion. In a hospital visitation, uh, we do that. The Lawrence State Hospital is, they are sick. There's some mental patients up there, but that, that doesn't mean that they're inferior. If you had a broken leg, you would go to the doctor, you would get it fixed. They have mental issues that in some cases they might be strongholds. Uh, but we, I, I, that door just recently opened, and again, it's not something I open because I'm not very good at opening prison door locks. I've never managed to pick one yet. This was by divine providence that that opened up. Uh, so this is all glory to God. It is not about me or about us. And by the way, uh, in the prison ministry, I'm getting a little overwhelmed because I, I, I do need help, and I would say that publicly. Uh, because I'm keep, keeping up with as much as I can and no more people coming in uh, to, to letter writing, uh, I, I need help. So at least pray for more laborers uh, or be part of the process, uh, a part of that labor. Uh, because sometimes I have letters sitting there for a week or more and I, they know that I can't respond in time. So, but that's happening uh, because the Word of God is getting into an institution going behind prison bars and people that are behind bars are being set free while people outside of the prison are still held captive, like Ephesians 1 or 2 said. So it's amazing they're being set free in prison. So that moved me. Oh, and I do want to say something about I was sick. Martha, when she was in school, and she still does this, she used her personal vacation days or sick days to transport her friends to chemotherapy or to uh, surgery or out of her own pocket. That is visiting me when I was sick. That's Jesus I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. So I did want to include that. And that's pretty unselfish. That's really difficult uh, for most of us to sacrifice to help someone else that doesn't even come to the church. So it's not always about who's here. And finally, I was in prison and you came to me. And now, I, some of, half of us here, well, maybe more less than that now because we have a prison ministry. Uh, there could be a lot of us that were there, okay? So imagine you're on the other side. So, I was in prison and you came to me. So what we do, we visit prisoners, we write letters, uh, we send Bible studies, uh, we bring food where, where they can. We, we, I buy them books and, and we send them commissary money. So that's reaching into the prison walls and I've actually got to go into Larned for the first time. And again, uh, God opened that door and, and I didn't. So you're seeing what is happening now with the body of Christ uh, that it has moving parts and then we all kind of fill in and I think the spirit moves us to put us in places that are not uh, We're not doing or we're not serving it just kind of fills in the blank But as long as we yield to the spirit and we have to give glory all the glory to God So 
then Jesus says in verse 25, verse 37, then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry uh, or thirsty or, or give you something to drink? Verse 38, and, and when did we see you as a stranger invite you in and, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? These guys have been doing works all their life and they're figuring, I don't remember that. I know why. This may explain it. When we remind others of our works, God forgets it. But if we forget what we've done in the sense that we don't tell people, God remembers. Okay, if, that, if you're already telling people, that's your reward. Congratulations, have a good day. That's it. Then, so, when you give to the needy, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 3, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I think that's what that means. You're giving to the needy. Okay, the left hand's going to tell the right hand, hey, I did this today. But... No. One thing I would say, and I, you don't have to turn there, is for those that are claiming good works, this is, this is a place that is a little bit scary. Some of the verses, I guess the Word of God, I've said somebody, the Word of God comforts the afflicted, right? but it also afflicts the comfortable. And it's supposed to do. It afflicts me before it ever hits you. In fact, it dices and slices me up well ahead of the time before this. So, Matthew 7, 21, you don't have to turn there. These are the people that are claiming good works, and the left hand is knowing what the right hand is doing. You know what? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. And you know the will of the Father is what the will of Jesus is. They're the same. They're never opposite. Many, not a few, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord. They repeated it twice, meaning it's a sign of intimacy. You know, Saul, Saul. You know, Moses, Moses. That's a sign of intimacy. So they think they got an intimate relation with Christ. Did we not prophesy in your name? The word prophecy in this context, I think, means forth-telling or truth or preaching. Uh, not predicting the future necessarily. And in your name we cast out demons and perform many wonderful works. And what happens? Jesus said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Now they claim to say, I know Christ and I knew God and I know Jesus. Better question. Does he know you? Amen. That is the question. Anybody can say, I know Christ or I know God. Does he know us? That's the best question. Concluding in Matthew 25, verse 40. The king will answer and say to them, Truly, I say to you, to the extent or the same measure, is what he's saying, that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. That does not necessarily mean inside the church or Christians or only because we don't know who God's brothers are. We don't know who's being called. <coughs> you did it to the least of these, my brothers, of mine. He's saying mine, even the least of them. Even the, think about that. The least of those who no one else wants to have anything to do, prisoners, homeless, you know, disabled people like that are the ones, the very ones that God wants to, is calling. Those are the least. When we do for them, we do it to Him. And finally, in Matthew 25, verse 41, then He will say to those on the left, remember the left, on the left side, that's not a good place to be at the time of Christ's coming. Depart from Me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and the angels. Because he says, Jesus in verse 42, Matthew 25, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Truly, to the extent that you did not do it, to the least of these, you didn't really do it to Christ. Think about that the next time 
you you help someone or hand a Bible track out at random or, or just give a person a cold drink of water. Think about that. You're not doing it for them necessarily. You're doing it for Christ. And that reward will not be lost. The body of Christ. I, I pray for more laborers because it, the, the harvest is, is great. It's greater than we can help and, and we can do on our own. Pray for the Lord of the harvest, not only just for the prison ministry, but to be the brethren evangelist or non-brethren if you're here, if you're guest, be the evangelist because that's the brethren way. We've always been reaching out to rescue the perishing. I think that is the brethren way. Dr. Hurd, would you close, sir? Let us pray. Well, we thank you for the truth of your word that challenges all of us to recognize that your essence is in all of the people we meet. Yes. That we, each person whose lives we touch that person was created by you for a purpose. You died on the cross for that person. And we're called to see in them you. We're called to see Jesus in all people and to be Jesus to all people. Lord, it's easy for us to get busy. Easy for us to become distracted. Easy for us to be driven by our own personal agendas and the events of our days. And to become blind and deaf and unfeeling to the needs that surround us. So we ask you again to, in a new way, break open our hearts. Take the scales from our eyes. Help us to hear and to see those around us who are always in need. And then give us those caring, loving hearts that allow us to be your hands and feet and voice of ministry. You've called us to be instruments. Help us to do that. For then we earn the incredible privilege of telling them our story of how we found you. And through that, that they might find you. And then find a community of faith with which to fellowship. So we ask that you would, uh, again, bless your word as we've heard it. Allow it to this changing work in our hearts and minds. And for Holy Spirit to go with us in His grace and mercy as we go forth to save and to share and to serve. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.